Hello, and welcome to Flicks in a Six. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Costanza, with me forever and always, the man, the myth. Uh, let's be serious, he's nobody. Alessandro Bielsi. I'm glad that I finally know what you think of me. <laughs> uh, today's episode, we're going to be talking about Mr. Nobody. Uh, but first, Al, what are we drinking? Um, so we are uh, back to drinking a the newest, or yeah, I guess it's the newest is accurate, the newest Al's Ale. I, you know what, um, full disclosure, I've made an, enti- an incredible mess over here <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I open that up. <laughs> There's just beer everywhere. The cap, the cap's gone. <laughs> I don't know where that is. <laughs> uh, Christ. Go uh, on. <laughs> Al's Ales. Powering through. Al's Ales. <laughs> um, powering through. This is the first official Al's Ale that is 100% it's my own recipe night designed by me. Um, although it is one ingredient was courtesy of a friend of the podcast, uh, Josh Arcaro, who uh, hooked me up with a big old bag of mosaic hops. Heady, top, so, heady Topper guy. Yeah, Heady Topper guy, for those of you who've been listening along. Um, so this is Al's Ale's Here Goes Nothing 1.5 IPA. <laughs> and for those of you who um, are big beer drunk- drinkers and are saying, what the hell is a 1.5 IPA? Beer drunkers? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was, uh, trying to make a double IPA, and, uh, I kind of lost a Missed little bit of information. Missed it by that much. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of lost track of a little bit of the information, um, during the planning phase, and did not properly calculate how much hops I would need to hit the mark for a double IPA, uh, as far as the, uh, beer style guides go. Mm. Um, I was able to calculate it afterwards, and, um, happily I just snuck inside the uh, the range of, um, not the spectrum, as Anthony asked several episodes ago, um, but inside the range of uh, what the IBUs you need for to be classified as double IPA. But I didn't really feel good about it, so I'm saying it's kind of halfway between a, a, just a traditional IPA and a double IPA. So it has uh, nugget and mosaic hops, um, and it also was uh, healthily dry hopped on more mosaic hops, because mm. I still have way too many mosaic hops. All the mosaic hops. <laughs> um, it's uh, got a 7.5% alcohol by volume. No soy in this beer. No soy in this beer. Um, actually, let's, let's cheers. Take a sip. Mm. Cheers. That didn't work again. I need a thing. Hang on. Ready? Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> So this is a this is a good this is there's no soy this is a this is a wood drink again. Yeah, absolutely. This is a wood drink again. This is actually I I will say this is it's either my favorite or second favorite of your brews so far. So it's funny you mentioned that. I'll get to that in uh, in a second because before that I was going to talk about um the flavor profile. Um, mm. the aroma is basically a grapefruit squirting in your nose. Um. It, that's that's from the mosaic hops, um, and you can taste it as well on the palate. Um, it's got a little, it's it's bitter, but it's not as bitter as it could be. I mean, it is strong. It's pretty full bodied. Uh, I used um, some amber uh, malt, and as well as a uh, little, well, more than a little bit of uh, caramel sixty love bond. For those of you who know um, how malt and grain works in beers, uh, and that's part of the reason. For those why. of us who don't. <laughs> So there's a um, scale, uh, they, they call it like the Love Bond scale, L-O-V-I-B-O-N-D, um, that they measures the, like how dark the um, caramel malts are, or I guess all, malt, all malts, um, for something that's like a pale ale, like is very low, it could be two or four degrees for, like I use caramel 60 or crystal 60, which is uh, quite dark. Um, that's a specialty grain. Hmm. Or mostly coloration and a little bit for uh, flavor. Um, so I was I wrote down some remarks when I was making it. Um, I'm gonna give you just a little bit of what I have in here because the whole thing isn't really. It's more for me than for anyone else. Al has a legit beer notebook that he's paging through right now, and it's fantastic. I do. Uh, that's what you do when you brew your own beers. You uh, start up a notebook. Um, so I said, I said that due to my confusion and laziness, I um, struggled to pre-calculate how much hops I would need, and thus almost fucked it up. Uh, <laughs> Can you write the rest of your notes in Old English? <laughs> that would be um, amazing. <laughs> actually, uh, because this is just for me, I do write it to entertain myself. 
Um, there's some stuff in here that other people probably would be like, why the fuck did he write that? And for me, I get a chuckle out of it. Um, and then I said, uh, I designed, I set out to design a kick-ass, bold double IPA, whereas this is likely on the cusp between an IPA and a double IPA. I still think it could taste great, so we can revisit that. Dry hopping on two ounces of mosaic holds great potential. And thus, the Here Goes Nothing moniker, a 1.5 IPA. <laughs> so I wrote notes to myself as well uh, after I actually got to taste it. That, that was written right after I was done um, brewing. So I said, it's good, as you might say. Mm. Indeed. <laughs> According to the taste testers, this may be my best one to date. Although, for my money, the Ruination clone, the Stone Ruination uh, double IPA clone I made last year, I think that's my best one. But I would say this is probably a close second. Uh, but I agree, this is quality beer. It's much better than I feared it would be. It's was that not the as bitter as I hoped. Imperial something or other one? What's that? Was that like the Imperial something or other one that you made that, that you were was referring the, to? Um, it was um, it was a Stone Double IPA, the Ruination. Um, I did. I found the clone recipe of it, and it came out really well. Now I'm trying to remember which one it is that I thought that I like. Um, the Russian Imperial Stout. That's the one. That was yeah. yeah. That was I the one that, that we I think that's that. number two, and this is number one for me. That was the one that we did, uh, the reserve label, uh, the one that was aged yes. for a year. Um, and I think that might have been the one you helped me brew last year. I forget. Speak, we don't speak of such things. <laughs> <laughs> that room that you're in right now haunts my dreams. <laughs> no, 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 not that oh, one. Oh, not that one? <laughs> no, no. That was two years ago. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, um... So it's a tasty, strong beer. The uh, alcohol content was exactly where I wanted it to be. Um, though um, Paul Haleko, the uh, one of the owners of the Newburgh Brewery, who um, I trade beer with, uh, said that he could. He thought it, he thought it was a little bit strong, but no one else complained about. It. He thought it tasted a little bit boozy. I, I you could tell the alcohol is there, but I didn't think that it was an overwhelming amount. Mm -hmm. Did you? Uh, no, but I I don't think it was overwhelming. But I understand where he's coming from. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely taste it, but that, like, I wanted it to be strong. Like, sure. that was not by accident. Right. Um, so I, I, I thought it was fine, and I didn't have anyone else um, refer to the alcohol content. No, they were all drinking it to get hammered, though. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> well, yeah, if you have a few of these, uh, this will take care of you real good. Yeah, it, it was a solid one. I, uh, I like it a lot. All right, excellent. So, so do, um, do, more like this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, so hopefully um, we can. I can give you a little uh, teaser of the next Al's Ale that you'll get. Um, it's ready this weekend. I uh, brewed it to be ready for um, my buddy Alex's wedding this weekend. So um, the groomsmen will be uh, partaking a little bit before the uh, service. <laughs> oh my god, what if you get them all sick? That would be horrible. <laughs> well, I've yet to have any sort of fuck up like that. And um, the alcohol content on this next one is also strong enough that hopefully it'll kill any... Uh... I had no contaminations, which of course, you know, we'll go knock on wood here. But right. I'm pretty <laughs> thorough um, the cleaning and sanitizing uh, to avoid just that issue. So the next one will be an amber ale. It's Al's Ale's Amber Ale, and because that's four A's, I named it the Quadrilogy. I like just it. Like, just I like, like it. the Alien Quadrilogy. <laughs> real usage of that word that I've ever seen. Oh, but it gets... That, that that just keeps getting bigger and bigger, doesn't it? Well, but the original four movies... Yeah, fair. Uh, before Prometheus and shit. Right. Have you seen that new one? You didn't see that new one. No, I, I feel know. like if you saw that new one, I would have seen that new one, and we would have yeah. talked about it. <laughs> I think we briefly discussed that neither of us was that interested in it. Yeah. Uh, Alien, a movie for me that doesn't hold up. I never saw it when I was younger, and I tried watching it with a buddy of mine, and we just had a rough time getting through it. I mean, obviously, like, the effects don't hold up, really. No, I just just as a whole, there's just not, like, if, if you, I feel like if you didn't grow up with it, or if it didn't mean something to you at some point, that movie doesn't doesn't matter. Huh, that's interesting cuz I how I, felt. I mean, I I saw bits of it when I was young. I mean, it's it's kind of a rough movie for someone who's like young to be watching. Mm -hmm. Um but I I mean, I've seen it all the way through, although the first and the second one sometimes kind of blur together for me. Mm -hmm. Um but I like both of those movies and that 
type of like horror stuff is not really exactly my thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess back then it was more so. I, I don't like how quite how gory they get now. Like Prometheus left me a little unsettled in a couple of scenes. Mm. I um, we watched uh, Chris and I sat down to watch the all of them, <laughs> and, and we got that's why the first and second blur together for me. But we got about three quarters of the way through the second one, and I turned to him. I was like, "What the fuck are we doing to ourselves right now?" <laughs> And See, I like, like yeah, the second. The second one's good. good. It's got a good cast. Like I enjoy the second one. Yeah, it was. It was. I, I think I was enjoying it more than the first. But I, at that point, I think I was just soured on the whole idea, and it wasn't doing it for me. I'll have to give them another try, one at a time. I mean, I I figured especially you'd like the second one because that didn't James Cameron do that one? Uh, maybe. I'm pretty sure he did. Looking. Which is why it turns Vamp. into Vamp. Like a Vamp. big action movie <laughs> instead of just a horror movie. Um, it has Michael Bean in it? Michael Bean? Uh, from the original Terminator. I probably just don't know him by name. Looking the, up the the, the guy who plays Kyle Connor or whatever his name is. Oh, what, Reese. Kyle Reese, whatever. Oh yeah, he's cool. I like him. What um was it? Aliens? Was that the second one? That's the second one. Yeah. What was I looking up? Oh, who directed it? <laughs> Ridley Scott. <laughs> Sam did, did the first, I guess. Oh no, that's well, Alien. Sorry, one. no, no. I'm in. I'm looking at Alien, and there's a there is a picture of aliens next to it. Uh, <laughs> Very deceiving, IMDb. Very deceiving. Clicking into it now. If I can get there. I don't know how computers work. I um, think. <laughs> yeah, you are correct, James Cameron. I probably would like that one better. I think in the same way that the wait, the way the original Star Wars trilogy went, where George Lucas like wrote and directed the first one and then right. kind of stepped back and was like just the overseer. Right. I think the same thing happened with the Alien movies, where Ridley Scott wrote directed the first one and then he stepped back and was just like the executive producer. Gotcha. And James Cameron actually did the directing. Yeah, let's see. He doesn't even have a. Wait, what's his credit on this? Ridley, where are you? No, no, nothing on the main page there. Really interesting. Maybe a it's be credited somehow. A, well, I don't think they don't list like all the producers or anything like that. Oh, okay. Um, on the main page, well, maybe sure, he's I'm got sure a he's involved in some way. Uh, I was looking at that too. Let's see. No, he's really not attached to this. Uh, that's weird. No. Interesting. Because I bet there's a circ- scoop there that we need to find out. <laughs> well, because he obviously circled back because he's the one who made. Uh, Prometheus and the new one that was at Alien right. Covenant. Yeah, he's the one. Who, he made those. Like he circled all the way back and took over again. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Curious. Very curious. We'll report back when we have more information. <laughs> yeah. Now that we've gotten way off topic, um, and we're going to continue. Stay off theme. topic. <laughs> we're going to continue that theme now for a couple minutes too, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's do it. There's um, some news. So- as you are uh, all aware, this is Flix of a Six podcast. Um, although, more accurately, maybe it should be Flix of a Six and Star Wars podcast. Mm, mm. Um, because we are unabashed and unashamedly gigantic Star Wars fans. Huge and nerds. there was big news this week. <laughs> what? Huge nerds. <laughs> there was big news this week um, with uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller uh, having... Well, at first it sounded like a mutual parting of ways, and, and the more... Info that comes out, it sounds like they were kind of unceremoniously fired from the project, actually, by uh, Kathleen Kennedy, who uh, mm. is the the big boss for Star Wars uh, <laughs> over at Disney. Uh, it's funny. It sounds like a like a video game. She's the one oh, you yeah. get to at the end. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a shame because both of us like Miller and Lord, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're the guys who made the the Jump Street movies. They made yep. Lego Batman. Um, they made something else too. They got some uh, chops. Yeah. Um, and they kind of seemed perfect for Han Solo, right? Yeah. I was excited when they were hired because Han is kind of irreverent and that's their thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you expect some humor and stuff like that. But it sounds like, at least in part, one of the reasons they were let go is that they were going way over the top with the humor thing. Really? And they were pissing off Kathleen Kennedy. They're pissing off Lawrence Kasdan and his son, who... Who've been writing these movies? Lawrence Kasdan came in. I think he was one of the like the lead writers, starting with Empire, oh, okay. and has I think has written all or at least part of every one since then. Interesting. Um, although I know they said he's he's pretty old now. I think so. They're going to be phasing him out 
either after Han. I don't I don't even know if he's working on episode nine at all. But they, his son has like joined him, and I think is going to replace him mm-hmm. as he kind of retires out of this. Okay. Um. So I guess there was so many issues with them shooting, and it seems like some people are saying that even though Lord and Miller are really talented, that uh, the scope of this project didn't really fit their style, that a lot of the work that they do is improvisational and it was leaving, they were losing way too much time. On some of the shoots, there was cast and crew that weren't able to do anything because they keep getting dragged in different ways. And they were trying to shoot with all these different like ad lib stuff. And that was pissing off Kasdan. And they, they like brought Lawrence Kasdan to oversee them. And they were getting into these big fights because he wanted them to do it exactly as the script was written. And mm. they, I guess to appease him and Kennedy, they shot at least one take of everything exactly how it was written and then went off and did their own thing. Interesting. Uh, so apparently there was a lot of strife. It's even been, I guess, reported. Um, and this is, I've seen this like reported. Uh, this part seems like it has to be fact. Um, when it was announced that Ron Howard was taking over, supposedly there was a standing ovation amongst the cast and crew. Wow. Which that, like, that would be crazy if that's the right? case. Right, like so. I mean, that is that's serious, serious strife. Um, mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of other things that seem kind of more like just people axe grinding. Although it sure. also seems to be, um, you won't be able to argue this. Um, supposedly, the um, Kathleen Kennedy and the other executives hate what Alden Ehrenreich, the guy who's playing Han, they hate what he's doing. They brought in an acting coach. They brought in really someone else. That apparently they hate this guy. Oh wow! <laughs> um, I've never seen him in anything, so I, I have no idea what he's like in any way, shape, do you, or form. Do you think there's any chance of him getting cut? I think it's too late to do that Probably, now. Probably right. That's what because, I would imagine. So they were supposed to have wrapped production by the end of July, mm. like principal photography. Now with they took a brief pause because they I I mean the way they brought in Howard was pretty quick. Um, you know, and they always have, if anytime they do this, they always have to have some sort of pause. They're supposed to resume shooting in like a week or so. Um, and I think they're supposed to finish by September sometime. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. The only thing I'm just like, if they need more time, I just, they really need to take it. Like, just don't rush it. I don't care. Well, they already are. They're longer. adding two more months under the I shooting I know, schedule. but if that's not enough, just go longer. We'll forgive you. If the movie's well, fantastic, we will forgive you. <laughs> I guess it depends. If they have a bunch of scenes that don't have Han in them, they maybe probably won't have to reshoot them. That's true. If he's the only real issue. Hmm. Um, although it sounds like, which is weird, if, if um, Lord and Miller are tweaking the script pissed off Kasdan, I already saw that Howard is already making changes um, maybe it's just the Kazan respects him and doesn't respect the other two. Possible. Well, I mean, you also got to think together those, before. those I don't two know. guys have a style, right? And they, they are they are comical. It is. I mean, I I'm total. I would have been totally down for the buddy cop Han movie. Like, I think that yeah. would be fun. I um, thought that's what we're getting. Yeah, but I mean, they do need to stay true to the universe and the lore and the and the style of Star Wars, if they're going too far off track, I totally respect them getting cut if they won't bring it back to what it should be. I mean, they and there is something that it should be. Like, it yeah. should fit in the Star Wars universe. And if it's straying too far, and it's becoming like this mockery, though funny, maybe it would be great, but as a spoof movie, who knows? Yeah. I don't know what they're doing, but... It's, it's true, and you'd like... You expect the Han movie to be funnier than any other Star Wars movie, although Star Wars is no um, is no stranger to those funny one-liners and even you know some uh, some minor slapstick stuff occasionally, sure. especially like the droids. You know, typically kind of fill that role or Jar Jar horrifically. But the beauty of it is it's done sparingly. Yes, and it's done um, well. Yeah, but so you would expect there to be more of that in a Han movie, but I guess they cross too much. The line. Yeah, too much could be could be terrible though. Yeah, it could ruin the whole true. thing. It could, it could just not. It would just not feel like a. If if there was so much of it, it wouldn't feel like a Star Wars movie. It would feel like a comedy, it, like a spinoff spoof joke movie, like another Spaceballs or something like that. Yeah, that's true. And above and beyond that, um, something serious has to go down to turn Han into the cynical asshole that he is. Right. So there has to be the resolution of this movie. You have to expect the final third of it to be rather dark in some way. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. 
I guess you're right. It depends. If everything's happy-go-lucky, then him and Lando wouldn't have split for 20 years. You know, Han wouldn't be this asshole they find in some cantina. He would just be some guy who's, you know, right. making jokes and stuff, you know? Yeah, they could go, like, real dark, like, last act of the movie or something crazy like that. Yeah. Like, really just, like, flip it on its head. That could be crazy, too. I- I'm excited, though. Ron Howard, I'm I'm in. Yeah, no, I like him. And, we, um, we have mentioned, uh, Al and I has talk, have talked about this um, a- outside of the show, but when he first dropped this news to me, my first reaction was, oh, dear God, please let him narrate like he does in Arrested Development. <laughs> and that obviously goes against everything that I just said. But yes, you can put that as the commentary track on the DVD, and I will watch that more than the movie. Yeah, we don't need a director's cut. <laughs> we need a director narration. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it has to happen. It would be so good. What was your line? Oh, I said, uh, don't worry, Chewie. I got this. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> that would be so good. I would love that. I would I would watch that over and over again. I would just crack up. Because that, oh my goodness. Like, that could be, see, that's a fun way to do it. If you have this real serious movie, and then just complete bonus, the commentary that nobody ever listens to is just this hidden gem. <laughs> yes. That would be amazing. <laughs> Oh man, um, I don't know. They, they everything so far has been going well. That's gotten released, so I'm not worried. I'm gonna let them let them do their thing. Well, and you you've been hearing there's been a lot of hang, hang ringing, you know, because Lord and Miller have this particular style and they clash, and it's like, oh, Star Wars is suppressing these guys and their vision. But I don't yeah, know, Ryan Johnson. No. <laughs> Ryan Johnson is. Like they considered something of an auteur, and he's saying how much he loved working on Star Wars, and that they right. didn't clamp down on him. So, I, like, you know, who are you supposed to believe? Although, supposedly, it wasn't reported this way at the time the movie was coming out, but they talked about those reshoots that they did for Rogue One, and it sounds like it wasn't a hundred percent what Gareth Edwards wanted done, and they brought in this other guy to do it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Tony Gilroy, I guess did most of the reshooting and Edwards was consulted, but he wasn't in charge anymore, which is kind of weird, but I, I don't know. He wasn't out and out fired. He, the, from what I understand, the majority of the movie was his that he made. So right. I don't know. But there was some clear meddling for just from watching that movie and like shifts in how things are done. If it feels there's something was going on, but yeah. And we, we talked about that yeah. in that episode, the rogue one episode, how um, the, a lot of the stuff that was in the promo material didn't make the final cut like a lot. Yeah. Like, not just, like, funny, like, you know, when you see, like, a movie with, like, a comedy like or whatever. Like, the whole cut promo joke, material. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, it, like they cut substantially different storyline right. beats out of the trailer. Well, anyway, I'm interested to see where this all goes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I I still want to see a Han movie. I still want to oh, see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, what they have to do with all the situation. Um, I like some of the people attached to this project. Um well, I liked some of the people behind the camera, and I like a bunch of the actors and actresses. So mm-hmm. I, I, and it's more Star Wars, so I, I want to see it. I would also not be opposed to a spoof movie. Like, yeah. I'm, I am on board. <laughs> well, that's another one where, like, you know, can we can we get the unreleased footage? Can we get what like was supposed <laughs> yeah, to be right. too funny? Like, a couple of scenes <laughs> here and there. They'll probably like they dropped the script <laughs> that they were like yeah. that they tooled around with. That'd be interesting. Someone probably set that shit on fire. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, yeah, we'll keep you posted on some more Star Wars news as the days go on. Um shall we get into it? Absolutely. So our flick for this evening evening for us uh is Mr. Nobody. Mr. Nobody is one of Al's favorites, I feel like. Uh he's mentioned it numerous times. Um movie came out 26th of September 2013, though the date is listed as 2009. I imagine some sort of festival <laughs> or not in the U.S. release. Uh, um, well, is that what I didn't see anything about that 2013? That was at the uh, the U.S. release date. Yeah, the U.S. release date is 2013. Because I've always seen it listed at 2009. I, yeah. So that seems um, like a big split um, in when it was released, as opposed to when it's listed at being released. Yeah, there's. I, I mean, there's there's some scenarios where that happens. There's some where it's even bigger, which is kind of crazy. But it's it could be like film festival type thing or. Um, but it's usually like a or... year or maybe two, not four. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's some history there that we did not look into. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it did come out several years ago. It was like an indie movie, right? Um, I mean, it's written. It's, it was 
like created, directed, or whatever by a Belgian guy. Mm-hmm. Um, who I was just looking at him real quick, and I don't know anything else he's done. Uh, something new we're going to do this episode and probably going forward is we're going to give you the synopsis right up front, uh, directly from IMDb. So, Mr. Nobody, uh, two hours, 21 minute drama fantasy romance, rated R. A boy stands on a station platform as the train is about to leave. Should he go with his mother or stay with his father? Infinite possibilities arise from the decision. As long as he doesn't choose, anything is possible. That's the premise of this movie. And part of the reason we're doing this now is you can now... Know the title of the movie, get the synopsis, and then we can go directly into spoilers. So if you think that that sounds interesting and you want to see that, watch it before you listen to the rest of this. Because we're going to spoil the shit out of this movie. And every oh, yeah. movie after the synopsis. You, you can't talk about this movie without spoiling it. it you really can't. I don't know how you, you can't really get anywhere. Because that, that actual part of the synopsis doesn't even happen until like 20, 30 minutes into the movie. <laughs> right? Well, because yeah. we talked about this in relation to um, some of the similarities of the ending of um, La La Land. Um, and I thought I did a pretty good job of not spoiling it, even though I talked about it for about five minutes. Um, just kind of the general mechanic of the way the movie was made. But to talk about anything really, really meaningful in this, you got to talk about specific plot points and yeah. specific performance-related stuff. So For sure. Um, so... Al has been talking this movie up for a while, and he's he's been wanting me to watch it. Uh, it's it's you mentioned you, the first time you mentioned this to, to me was was quite some time ago. I feel like yeah, it's probably about two years ago, something like that. And you bring it up a lot. You'll you'll reference it when you're talking about other movies. You'll reference it with any pop culture information. You 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 dig this movie? I do. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's it's one of my favorites, but I. Against my uh, initial judgment, uh, I really enjoyed this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but my viewing experience of it was interesting. Um, it yeah. was almost a movie that we never would have talked about because after about 15, 20 minutes, I almost turned it off. Interesting. And I was like, I'm going to give this 10 more minutes um, because it's just early on in the movie, it's very confusing. Oh, it is certainly confusing. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give this about 10, 15 more minutes, and if it doesn't start making sense, I'm done. Mm-hmm. And it clicked, and I sat down and watched the rest of the movie. Right. And I've watched it three or four times now. Uh, now I, I genuinely enjoy it. It's just so unique. It's unlike anything else I've really watched. I, I gotta say, I was feeling the same way as I watched it. Um, I didn't actually, I don't think you've actually expressed that to me about watching this movie. Oh, no, I'm, I, I'm sure I did. I yeah. definitely told you, you need to power through the first 20 so, minutes. So, yeah, okay. So, like, I, the, my thing is, I I think I've maybe turned off one or two movies in my life. Um, one I might have, and one of them might not count, because I think I might have been tired and fell asleep. And that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> um, I will tell you that I turned off Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. I, um, I know that people love that movie. I did no, not I care almost did for that, too. That movie made no fucking sense. And I think, I, I was, like, 20, 30 minutes into it, and I was like, you know what? Nah. I'm out. You're, you Sign probably off. made the right choice. I, I watched the whole thing, and I'm still not entirely sure what the fuck happened. And yeah. I'm someone who was cut who cut my teeth on those sorts of like World War II, Cold War, right? Like spy intrigue, like books, movies, like that. That's like one of my like favorite things. Like yeah. I'm huge by all rock- accounts, like what I had read and the previews and my I the and the cast. Like I should have. I feel like I should have loved that movie, but I'm in exactly the same boat. I man. was just very. I was very upset. So this movie, um, as I said, it takes a while to get into, and I got into it. And after one viewing, I do have to say that this movie is deep. It's, whoa, well, yeah. <laughs> it is deep up its own ass. <laughs> <laughs> it is insanely pretentious at times. I, I, I There's just so much that, like, they're trying to be so, just, just, they're trying too hard to be artsy with a lot of the scenes that they shoot. Um, I feel like there's a ton of the movie that I feel like there's a ton of shots and storytelling mechanics that are unnecessary and actually take me out of the experience. Um, but the underlying themes of the movie and the last five minutes closing out the film make me go, okay, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm in. I'll, I, I could if you if you have the uh, if, if if you have the time if you can spare the time to actually sit through this. It, it'll make you think. It's got some cool ideas. I think it could have been done better. I think, uh, it, and that that depends if I if if the way that I feel about the story is actually like what the director and storytellers intended. Um, 
that might not be the case. If it's not the case, then I might not care. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but well, but some, some of what you said about um, uh, that some of it probably could have been done a little bit better. It's probably true because I, I think this was the, the director's first – and he wrote and directed it. It was his first fe- feature-length film, I think. Okay. So some of that stuff, if it came off, I guess, is rough in the way like, you know, oh, this could have been done better or this probably should have been clipped just for brevity's sake, you know. That's probably true with some of it. Sure. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I didn't actually really get um, a pretentious vibe from any of it. Mm-hmm. Some of the other things you said, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with. Um, it definitely has a story that it wants to tell you. Um, and uh, if that's if it's if the, its insistence on telling you that story is pretentious, then I guess. But I, I actually sure. didn't have a problem with that. I didn't have any sort of like I didn't feel any pushback while watching the movie. Right. I, uh, I, other than that, I said it was probably a little overly confusing to get to the point where you're like, oh, I get why all these things are happening that mm-hmm. aren't related to each other. Like that once you finally like you like you you probably remember the moment, right? Like or remember that you had the moment, right? Where you're like, Oh, I get it now. <laughs> I'm I'm not entirely sure how what portion of it you're referring to, but for me it was like if I had turned the movie off maybe five minutes before the end, I would have this would have been a different review and I would have been ripping this movie a new asshole. Oh, really? No, yeah. see once I was in about a half an hour or so, I was fully engrossed in what was it, going on. It wasn't that I didn't get it. It was that I didn't care. Until I developed an opinion on what they were trying to tell me. Okay. By the end. Um, no, I was fully engrossed like with it once I fully got what they were trying to do. Because mm-hmm. um, it was almost like I got to watch three movies for the price of one. Yeah. That's fair. Um, so I got to kind of... And it's a it's a love story, right? Um, so you kind of get to fall in love three times, or even more, when mm-hmm. you consider some of the offshoots of the storylines right. alongside of this guy, and, and see how that sort of thing goes. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it for whatever reason, it really resonated with me. This this movie, um, I, I, like what you said. You know, if you have the time, you should. Every I I think anyone who's willing to to give their time and their attention to this sort of movie, sure. even if you come out of it hating it. Um, there, you can't. Hate, I don't think you can hate the whole thing if no. you really in, like, like get into the experience of the movie. And there's even if you gotta hated be something it, though, in there that resonates. Yeah, and if you hate it, you're it, it will be enjoyable to talk about. Like there's like even if you hate it, there's there's going to be things that you can pick apart. There's a lot of things that I would have tried to pick apart and like been angry about probably um, until I kind of turned around and looked back on the movie which is one of my favorite things to do is when it's over is really think about all the scenes especially the scenes that bothered me and like the concepts that bothered me and then see if like there's a meaning to it by the end and a lot of them really checked out um this movie deals with choice and time yes and if your movie or story deals with time there's your hook for me if you say the word time i'm in i love it I just I love like the, the just the concept and the manipulating it and the possibilities and what it means and it's just like that's what like that and the way that they bring time and choice together in this movie is fantastic. I love oh, that yes. portion of it. Yeah, definitely. Especially um once I when I finally made the connection between the story that he's telling and the fact that, you know, you're like, well, how does... Because the interviews if the interview is asking the old man, played by young Jared Leto, mm-hmm. um, like, about his life and stuff like that. And it's like, well, how does he not know? It kind of reminds me of uh, The Prestige when um, Hugh Jackman's reading the journal. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, well, how can he not know? And it's the whole thing of, you know, because was it Fallon or was it uh, Borden that actually did it? Right. Um, but with this one, it's coming to the realization that oh he's lived such a long life and he had that profound out of body experience of imagining the three separate paths his life could have gone on or the three main trees of life that he could have lived mm-hmm. and you realize oh he's lived so long and he's so old and he's so 
he actually doesn't remember and he's trying as he's telling the story he's trying to piece together right what actually he lived that was uh, it was just so profound to me uh, um here's a question for you though i got that from it early on that's the part that i understood like early in the movie but towards the end of the movie i started changing how i thought he was approaching it and i feel like that's the face value version of what's going on in the movie but i feel like there's an, there's um there's other possibilities um what do you mean so the idea that he's just like he like you were saying he had this outer body experience and he was able, he thought through every choice until the end yes right that's one way the other way that i was thinking is there's this whole concept in the movie that um, there was a big bang, there was going to be a big crunch, yes. and time's going to go backwards. Um, did did he make every choice? Is he reliving his life over and over again? And at the time of his death, does everything rewind? And he has this ability to know some of the choices that he's made because he retains his future memories, but so they're getting words- messed up because he's old. His body is deteriorating. His mind is deteriorating, but he has these glimpses of glimpses of it. So he's he's getting them confused because he has lived all these experiences, and that big crunch happens not at a certain time, in as time as we know it, but when he di- when you die. So you're wondering whether the big bang and the big crunch are not two endpoints on a finite line of of timeline, but rather simply the apex of a swing of the pendulum as it goes back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't really think about it that way, um, I but I can de- like definitely see where you're going with that. This is the type of movie where I feel like once you've seen it, you got to go like search out like message boards and shit like of like people talking about this to hear right. all these sorts of things. And I have not done that. Um, yeah, I, I haven't done it either. I like I I don't want that's it's too soon for me to do that. I need to. I like developing my own deep oh, thought definitely. on it first. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and this is kind of uh, like the perfect step for us, right? Where we can kind of hash this out right mm-hmm. here together. Um, but I'm going to say as compelling as that theory is, and it does fit. It, it yeah. can fit. Um, I would say that the only thing that you could actually take at face value in this movie would go against that grain. Because at the end, you see the little boy make the choice and run. Right. Um, and he, as he picks his direction, right? Um, so that would lead you to believe that he did choose one of those things, but that it struck such a chord deepest in his psychology and, con- and, and his consciousness that, uh, that when his mind is deteriorated and he's got, I mean, it, when you've lived, what was he like 120 years old? Yeah, or something 118. Like that, 118. Was that what it was? Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, everyone basically has some form of dementia at that point, I imagine, right? Right. So such a vivid dream sequence would be maybe one of the few things that stuck out to him. So he had trouble picking what was real and what wasn't Mm -hmm. until he talked himself through it. Because, and I think this is like a great time because you mentioned the idea of the big crunch. Uh, How cool was that ending sequence when... They he dies and the big crunch just so happens to happen at the end of his death. Right. And they show it all backwards, and because he lived it all, he knows what's coming. Right. And he's got a big fucking smile on his face as he's walking backwards. Yeah, and, and becoming younger. That's what that is very cool. But that's what that's also part of the reason why I think that he's doing that he's just living this over and over again, and he's remembering what happened. No, I agree that that that's that sequence would lend itself to that sort yeah. of theory. You're, you're, you're right. Um, I or do could lend itself to that. There's yeah, it just, uh, but I do love that. I love thinking about something like that. Like the, like the, the, like what, like that concept of if it goes forward and then goes back and then you could just go a different way and like go back and just keep making over and over again. Like, like a choose your own adventure book. Yeah. Like it, it's almost like that scene at the end where he's running away from the train. Yes. Um, it's almost like, okay, that's, this is his next run, and that's what he's gonna do. That's I don't know, you know. I, I can see that, I guess. I then I, I want I want to stick with that because I like that version of it the best so far. <laughs> okay. See, the thing is, um, the way that that it worked towards the end, as he 
because he towards the end of the interview, right? He seems to, right before he dies. Uh, it seems like he finally hones in on one specific storyline, and it's the one with Di- Diane Kruger. Right, and I was curious about that as well, and I was like, okay, is this the real one, or is this Because everything the one... else seems to fall off to the side from there, right. and hones in on just that story instead of branching any further. Right, for sure. But, and then, what bring, bringing me back to my idea, that's the one that he lived in this life. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. It's, it's not the one true one. Yeah. It's the one that he remembers because it happened most recently, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually like to think that that was the one true one just because I I just myself felt the deepest connection to that character. Sure. I liked that character, so I liked the I idea too, yeah. of him ending up with her because mm-hmm. that's the one that seemed the best for him the best life for him he was the happiest you know what i mean yeah yeah it's it, it just it's it I, I i did love i just love that there's there were so many storylines going on and i i like that like having i like when the movie makes me think i really yeah. appreciate that i like when and that is the one thing the even thing. if the, even if the movie is imperfect and even if you ultimately didn't like it that much mm-hmm. um there's no way that you can like like you said like turning a movie off or whatever like i don't think you can end watching that movie and if you really embrace the experience i don't think you can actually be angry that you watched it no because of the the type of mental journey that you go through and the emotional journey watching it yeah i i i did feel that way though before like i said the last five minutes before i developed this opinion of maybe this is how the story is laid out because i actually don't care for the idea that he's he's just thinking of all the possibilities of how because everything's so vivid i feel like that falls a little flat Okay, I mean, yeah, um, and that's that's where the subjectivity, you know, yeah. definitely comes into it, right? For sure, and I, like I said, if that was the case, I probably wouldn't have cared for the movie. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm going to continue to believe <laughs> that, that he keeps reliving his life and making a different choice each way through. I think we can all agree, though, at one point or another, you really, the person that you really connect with, is that reporter. <laughs> <laughs> and halfway through the movie, you're like, what the. F- fuck is this movie about <laughs> yeah um uh, was that guy anyone because he did look kind of familiar he looked familiar yeah i'm not sure let me see if i could pull him up here daniel oh he Mays. was in rogue one. <laughs> oh man that explains it oh yeah that I don't guy know. who was he tivik yeah i don't know who that is i remember his face in the movie i have a picture of him in the movie do you yeah, go on. Well, we'll do this offline. But if you scroll through his uh, his images on <laughs> either Google or IMDb, you can see him. Um, yeah, that's why he looks familiar, though. You're correct. Um, oh wait, we see the guy that he that that um, what's his name kills in yeah. the beginning. Mm-hmm. Ah, I believe okay. so. Then yeah, yeah, okay, that that actually makes sense then. Yeah, um, I've, I'm almost certain that's who it was. Uh, but yeah. Like I said, he's he's very he's very like distraught <laughs> halfway through his interview, <laughs> and and I feel like we all we're all on the same page. Well, he is. I think he is meant to be a proxy for the audience. Oh right? yeah, hundred percent. Because he and he voices that question that you have when you're trying to understand what's going on. Wait, which one? What? what yeah, why yeah. are you telling me all these stories? Which one is real? Yeah, and, and he the asked old that. man, the old man laughing once? at that. Yeah, the old man laughing at that. though, was the whole point. Like that's not what's important. Relax. What's guy. important is the story. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, the another thing that I feel like we can agree on is that in all of these stories, his mom's a bitch. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> she's the worst. <laughs> yeah, it's funny too because a lot of times when you see this type of movie where. There's like that divorce, right? And they try and paint the picture of the two parents. And you want to give them both kind of equal, like where yeah. you want to understand both sides of the story, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it it definitely seems like she was more in the wrong. That yeah, she was... and I he, they they humanize the father so much, and you feel so badly for him because you first the first time when you're when you're going through that stage of thinking, okay, what did they each do? And you see yeah. the tear rolling down the father's face. You're like, okay, so he's there's something here, right? Like there's something went on, and we never actually find out what that is if there was something. But 
as the movie goes on and you keep seeing glimpses of his father in different frames, like in different storylines, you're like, this guy's entire life is a bad beat. He's a yes. shitty weatherman who can't get things right. <laughs> his wife <laughs> left him and now he can't move. <laughs> like this is, oh, and, 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 and the first time you see him, his son leaves him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that guy's jumping in front of the next train. Yes. In the first in the first leg. <laughs> yeah, especially I mean he just seems like a decent guy, right? Yeah. And he there was, was a some... great guy in the replacements. He was the kicker and he was awesome. <laughs> oh, it's funny cuz I was thinking of him from um you're right, I, but I was thinking of him from Harry Potter and then even more recently yeah, yeah. The, the Amazing Spider-Man. Yep. Um I, that's right, you know. <laughs> he's wiry. <laughs> in the replacement <laughs> while he's smoking movie. a cigarette on the yeah. field kicking field goals so great oh man that movie is so silly uh yeah <laughs> um but yeah and actually some of the more like emotional parts and one of the things that helped forge, forge the connection I think um was the relationship between father and son especially in the one where he stays with him and his father I I to develop ALS, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Um, it wasn't clear, but I don't, it obviously it wasn't the point either. But yeah. no, no, because they fall on such hard, hard times, mm-hmm. and the mother doesn't support them, and it's just like a fifteen-year-old kid who's got to take care of his decrepit father, and it's like that was heartbreaking. Yeah, but you you could see like he didn't feel any resentment. No, and in none of the storylines does he. No, which is interesting. He's like a he's a constant throughout all of the different branches. I feel like. Yeah, uh, but it just struck me that relationship was special. Where mm-hmm. like to the point where, like you said, the first one is the one where he leaves the father. Like after, like when you like once you've watched that their relationship development on the other storylines, and you retroactively apply that to the one where he, it's like wow, like how could he do that? To his father who loves him so much and, right. and shows so much love towards his father. To oh, watch right. He's fucking heartbreak. six. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> what? Oh, right. He's six. That's how yeah. he can do it. <laughs> no, I know. I understand. Yeah, it's yeah. just, well, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's to, like, that you missed out on that that love between the father and son, um, mm-hmm. or that had the potentiality to miss out on that if it wasn't the one that really happened. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Because I never felt that connection between him and the mother. Right. His mother's always the worst. I know. <laughs> She's the She's worst. The worst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's Free the worst. Right <laughs> oh my god. She's the worst. <laughs> um, that covers my segment of that I have written down here of dad gets shit on. That is. That is the note that I had taken down that I wanted to touch on that. No, but seriously, he's a. It, I think that guy's acting in the movie is tremendous. Yeah, no, he's a good actor. He he really uh, he pulls on the heartstrings. Um, and like, I mean, there's no way of getting like you have to talk about it, it because he's so central to every single scene. Basically, what did you think of Jared Leto in this? Um, I like him in certain. In certain branches, and I dislike him in others. Um, Which I mean, that's could be true of anyone or anything in any of these in this yeah, movie, right? No, for sure. Um, he's his old man bothers the hell out of me. <laughs> um, there's a couple of reasons there. One is it's like a spit it out already, old guy. Um, there's that. But he's 118. I get it. I get it. Um, I thought he was playing what I expect an 118 year old man on his deathbed might sound like. Yeah, except when he's walking with that cane, it's just brutal to watch that scene. But it's also he's at a 90 funny. degree <laughs> angle, and he's <laughs> hobbling towards the window. It's just, it's rough. Another thing that that struck me um, and like pulled me right out of the experience of watching this movie is finding out that his old man laugh is also his Joker laugh, and it's <laughs> terrifying. It's actually scarier as the old man. Okay, I mean, um, no, I but understand. all, all, all in all, though, I, I like him. I, I have nothing against him as an actor. I think he's great. Well, I earlier in his acting career, I just didn't think much of him as an actor. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but it's weird because I I saw him in several roles before I saw this one, but this one actually took place or was shot well before people started to care about him as an actor, I feel right. like. Yeah. Um, which is funny because he's got so much room to to do all these different versions of himself, essentially, right? Yeah. Um, old, young, you know, one storyline or the other. Um, I really liked him in this. Um, yeah. I, I, I thought he was really good. No, yeah, I think, yeah, he, he's, he definitely delivers. I thought something more interesting than just him is that the way that they casted the children and the teens that then played the older characters... Yeah, like I feel like they were on the nose with everyone they casted. Yes, that was really cool. Um, you know, both the actors playing him and then the actors playing the assorted women that he right. falls in love with, depending on the storyline. You're right; it was, it was cool. It was, Each one looking like the younger version of right. Like the, the, the way they jumped around, like you should have one hundred percent, like one hundred percent for forgotten who they were talking about or showing you here and there, but you didn't because the little kid to the adult. To the adolescent, they all looked the same. Like they looked yes. like, oh yeah, that's that character. Okay, yep. cool. That's that. Ca- it, it's it was crazy that they pulled that off. Um, that uh, yeah, uh, you said it was Anna's the storyline that we like. It was Anna's was the name, right? For the yeah, Diane yeah. Kirkwood was Anna. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Helen. Um, that <laughs> that <laughs> that Troy. yeah that that storyline was like that was the most engaging to watch like that was like that was the straight up romance movie you know it was a it, there was just like a beautiful story there like at least of these two kids that have really sh- shitty lives because of their shitty parents <laughs> and yeah. like the way they come together and like they can connect on a level because they're going through the same thing that other like they probably feel so alienated by everybody else yes but there's they, that they idea of each them. other oh it's beautiful there's <laughs> There's an idea of each of them being kind of the mirrored reflection of the other. Right. And seeing that in each other. You're right. I, that That's why that chord is struck. There is just such a connection. And, and it, it's it's also the chemistry of the two actors. I thought that they yeah, yeah, for sure. had great chemistry on screen. Mm-hmm. And then they're, they're crappy parents trying to make it seem like it's a bad thing. But meanwhile, they're just trying to make them as unhappy as, the, as they are. <laughs> True. Although, I mean, I guess I can understand because it was oh, kind yeah, of weird no. boundary. It, uh... It was weird, but what's also weird is them each cheating on their <laughs> on their significant other and then joining together and pretending like everything's going to be all hunky dory and these yes. two are going to be brother and sister. Nah. Yep. Nah. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, it, it's all sorts of fucked up. The fact that if you hold that storyline is true, that both of them ultimately end up as relatively normal people, right? Hmm. Um. Probably a miracle. <laughs> yeah. Kind of crazy. Uh, they don't. Um, I guess. Okay. Re- you said relatively normal. Yeah. Fair. Relative. Fair. Um, I do want a sequel to this movie that follows the joint off of the building. Wait, what? She throws a joint off the building when the parents come in the room, and I want a sequel. Oh, when they're listening. When they're listening to the Pixies. Yeah, and I want a sequel that the camera just follows the joint right off the building, and, and sees like, all the different storylines. Yeah, exactly. Because they do a whole. They do the whole butterfly effect thing throughout the entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to see what kind of havoc that thing wreaks when it hits the ground. <laughs> that was the, it was like the weirdest thing that stuck with me. I was like, that they threw it off the like she flicks it off the building, and I'm like, two scenes later, I'm like, wait, what about the joint? <laughs> like, that could be bad. <laughs> oh, that was funny. I had I had a chuckle there by myself watching the movie. I was like, <laughs> uh, I want to see that movie. <laughs> <laughs> see, it's funny though because like we were saying um, that we both like that story. We like Anna, that character, the, the way that that story goes. Yeah. And some of the stuff with Elise, who was played by Sarah Polly, was really some of it was really hard to watch. Yeah. Um. And I didn't think they did a bad job. I, I think no. it was supposed to be uncomfortable, right? It is supposed to be uncomfortable, and it is a very real thing. But it was just like I don't want to watch this one. Yeah. Um. And it's it's a shame too that you kind of associate that negativity because I actually like Sarah Polly. I, I liked her in Dawn of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Um. But it, it it was it was tough to see that, and and I also I mean there's that which is kind of like tough to watch, and then. You just feel bad for the third woman because I on the yes. top of the fact 
Yes. Right? Gene deserves a hug. That is the other line in my notebook. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few characters that deserve hugs in this movie. One is the dad, what he's going to forget. Two is the reporter, because he's having a rough time reporting on the story. And three, <laughs> and most importantly, Gene, who, who drew the short straw here, gets this douchebag that is just revenge marries her. It's horrible. Yes. It's horrible. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, there's that. There's the fact that they really seem to focus on the other two storylines more, and that it kind of felt like that one got short shrift all the time. Yeah. Just like um, she did. <laughs> what? Just like she did. Yeah, I mean, I guess kind of by design, right? Yeah, I feel like it probably was not intentional at all, but it, if you if you look at it that way, it plays out. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there's a three-hour version of this movie where <laughs> oh, both yeah. well, there is got a director's exactly cut. the same treatment. There's a director's cut, and I would like to see it now. <laughs> um. To be really that's, curious. That's for that tangent, the fourth storyline of just the the joint. That's where that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Or or the uh, the director's cut just makes you feel even worse for her, and they don't add any time to her storyline. Oh <laughs> it's no. It's just more in between, and you're just like, ugh, what the hell? <laughs> but uh, yeah, the 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 Elise storyline. Ugh, that was that was that was a hard one to watch. It got to the point where we like, did get to go to Mars. Yes, which is cool. Also, I love the thing with... Was it the bicycles? Yeah. Yeah. I actually like that. I kind of cracked up at that. <laughs> it's just the, all the bicycles floating through the air after they were completely destroyed. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, because he says something about it earlier, right? Yeah. When he's talking to her on the... He's, he's talking to her he on asks the... asks what's with all the bikes. I don't remember what her response is. It was something about, like, they can't make them up there and we're bringing them up as, like, extra storage or something like yeah. that. Like, see, because, like, that was the type of thing where I actually, even though it's, like, maybe a bit incongruous, it was one of those, like, just minute details that, like, when you're paying attention and watching the movie, like, I feel, I, I, I that's why I chuckled, like, oh, the bicycles they talked about. Right. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I thought that was yeah. a cool little you, note. You chuckled like that. I just went, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> so, like, that, <laughs> that's exactly it. Like, you know, like, yeah. it's like. Like, you can't get frustrated at that. Like, you gotta be like, alright, I see what you did there. I like that. Yeah. But, uh, the... That that was another... One other part of the movie that I was, like, thinking heavily about. I was like, what what was the budget on this movie? Because it gets surprisingly sci-fi. And it it's not the worst sci-fi. <laughs> no, surprising for, like, an indie-type movie. Like, right? you would think... What? I, right? <laughs> that, that's yeah, what but they... they there's some pretty solid effects in that. Yeah, I was I was very surprised by that. But uh the Yeah, the, the, that storyline though, it just like everything about it sucks. Um from the minute like you see her in the high was it a high school dance and she's with the the crappy boyfriend or maybe he's not crappy, maybe he just knows that she's crazy. Um, yeah, cuz she has like a like a gargantuan freak out. Oh yeah, she has a total meltdown and then he follows her out of the building i was like okay mistake number one (laughs) (laughs) just let that one go (laughs) just that was horrible i was like oh i see where this storyline's going (laughs) (laughs) Uh, poor gene yeah and it's interesting because even when you talk about the when there was the storyline where they're on the bridge and the explosion happens that's anna right that no that's uh that's elise was it? I think so. Yeah, it is. I'm actually, it, yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I'm probably I'm showing it, to the audience is, here. It is. I've seen this several times, but it's been about a year since I saw it the last time. The the reason I remember that it is specifically is that after that, that's the that's the timeline where he has the scar on his face, and he's the photographer, and he's taking pictures of the food. He walks yes. into the house, and he says, um, like, he's like, "Honey, I'm home," or something like that. He walks into the back room, and it's the ashes, and it's the same ashes that he brings to Mars. Uh, that's right, and he talks to Anna up on the space station, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yes, you're right. See, that one, though, that was an interesting way that they did it all, because it, even though we saw in a storyline where they were able to have a more full life, things seemed like they could have been happy, like how heartbroken he is when it happens, right? Right. There was, there was, a, there was the potential for that to actually... That's one of the things that made me not completely write off the Elise storyline altogether because there was a photograph just one snapshot there before she dies in that explosion where you could kind of see that becoming 
you could see him find the happiness he was looking for with right her. yeah that that was that was strange like in this all like it, but it almost like kind of lends itself to this whole thing it's, if he goes with her it's not a happy ending it's gonna go, it's gonna that, end yeah, badly true. in a shit ton of ways one like, I mean, she's gonna be depressed like her the- entire life two the truck in front of her is going to explode and kill her then you're gonna explode outside of Mars <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's not it's not gonna be good. <laughs> Yeah, but I guess that's true. That's kind of where you get the more literal read of, like, as much as I hate to admit it, considering I don't like him, but the Ashton Kutcher butterfly effect movie. Yeah, yeah. Like, her storyline is almost directly that sort of translation, right? Right. Where it's like, even when it looks like things could have gone well, something else manages to get (laughs) fucked up. (laughs) She blew up. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Everything everything about that entire storyline is depressing. Much like her state in that entire storyline. Yeah, and it's sad. Like you do feel bad. Yeah. For her, oh right? no, absolutely. Like it, I, I kind of feel like we're piling on her a bit, right? Um, well, well first off, tremendous intention. acting on her part. On her part, port, <laughs> because it was very believable. Yes. Um, but the bad thing about this, this is not what I want to watch right now. <laughs> this is, That's true. <laughs> this is no, just, I mean, this movie this makes rough. you feel a whole different bunch of ways during sure. the course of the run. Yeah. Um, which is, again, another reason why I feel like it's kind of a must-watch type of movie, right? Because, I mean, it makes you feel. Yeah. I, 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 there's other movies that'll make you feel. I don't think this movie's for everyone. I really oh, don't. Oh, it's, yeah. it's definitely not for everyone. Um, I only advise you to watch this movie because I know, having watched other movies, whether you liked them or not, just talking to you about it. Um, yeah. You know, we haven't talked about it all this, but do you understand why I made such a strong connection? Oh yeah, for this sure. And Cloud uh, Atlas and this, and this. And- yeah, absolutely. Like, but it's it's the same thing though. We like uh, we both like a movie that'll make you think, and a movie that it lasts after the after the movie's over. Yeah. Um, I don't think I, I would venture that seventy five percent of people that watch movies are not into it for that. Probably true. You know, um, this this definitely has kind of a niche like audience. Um. But I, because I knew you were able to get through and, and enjoy Cloud an Atlas. What? <laughs> did, did I have an itch? That is a no, deep no, cut no, from no. Boy Meets World. So, oh. Yeah, no. For that anyway. one fan out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I knew you enjoyed and embraced the experience of watching Cloud Atlas. That's why I referred yeah. you to watch this one, because I knew you would give it its due. We, I had mentioned this to Al. We will be doing Cloud Atlas Someday, but I need to see the movie two more times before we review it. <laughs> yeah, well, once as a fan and once as a critic. Exactly. I'm so glad that you love that movie. If you didn't like that movie, it would have it would have hurt me. Yeah, this probably would have never happened. Yeah, or at least <laughs> it would end sooner than it should. Yeah, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> what if the third time that I watch the movie, I'm like, this is trash. Ah, <laughs> uh, that would be heartbreaking for me. That would like they'd be like this whole storyline. This, where where we break up the group, we don't do this anymore, and then you go watch the movie again, and you're like, this is really isn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> and you've thrown it all away. <laughs> uh, that would, um... No, that would hurt me. That would hurt me on a, on a personal level. Okay. We've gotten through the good, like, the details, the good stuff in this movie. Now, one of the things that bothers the hell out of me is the strange dream sequence with the with the argyle sweaters and the argyle walls <laughs> and I just don't I don't get it I don't like it 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 ruins the experience for me uh that's where he is the what weird one where he watches himself on the video that's part of it it happens a couple of times yeah He's in the streets. There's all red cars except for his car, and then he like yep. chases himself into a. He chases hobo him into the building. Also, even though he's uncredited, clearly during that sequence, um, what's the name? Wes Anderson took over. Yeah, right. Hundred <laughs> <100%. laughs> percent. Because uh, all uh, all the all symmetrical the, shots, the scenery and stuff, <laughs> right? Looked like yeah. they, like the. The little like dollhouse stuff that Wes Anderson does with all yeah. his backgrounds Wait, in he, his like, movie. He like wakes up in the bed and he sits up straight and he was like, I, in my head he was like, and you think I killed her? <laughs> <laughs> Co flips <laughs> into the wind. <laughs> As a no, Grand I, I, Budapest I, reference for those of you who have seen that movie. <laughs> Wait, what's that? That was a Grand Budapest reference for those yes. of you who have seen that movie. I love that movie. Oh, uh, that was <laughs> such a, that, I know. We could do an episode on that. We man. absolutely should. 
Actually, yeah, let's let's write that down. We're gonna do an episode on that eventually. Yeah. I love that movie. Oh man, that is such a great scene. And you think I killed her? <laughs> and he runs away. <laughs> great. Oh my god. That just that that just that like five seconds of that movie encapsulates that whole movie. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That is that is the movie in a nutshell. Yes. Um, but back to back to Mister Nobody though. What is what is the point of those scenes? So, okay, you're gonna have to bear with me slightly because okay. I, I wish you had given me another day's heads. Like if you had told me Saturday <laughs> that we you wanted to do this, because I would have liked to rewatch at least certain key scenes of uh-huh. this movie. Yeah. Because and you wouldn't have rewatched this one, so go on. <laughs> no, I would have because it was confusing to me the first time I saw it. Okay. Um, but I'm sure that I'm going to be a little hazy on the details, so maybe some of the things I'm thinking of, you may have to kind of semi-correct me. Okay. But if I remember, I think the whole point of that is, and that's, I think, what lends itself to this being something that you read strictly as it being one thing that happened eventually. Okay. I think that's kind of his inner monologue or his conscience telling him, like, Tick tock, the time is coming. You have to make the choice. Because it's kind of meta and like breaks the fourth wall in like a Deadpoolish type of way. Because isn't the that's, whole, an, that's an insult to Deadpool? No, no <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he's talking to himself through a TV screen. Yeah, you know I, mean? it doesn't. It, I get like the. I think the. Um, the through line for those scenes is he's either asleep or hypnotized when you get those scenes. Yeah. But I, it just doesn't, it doesn't add any value to me and it takes away from what I was getting out of the movie. See, I, I kind of agreed with that the first time I watched it, but once I knew that I needed to focus in and try and evaluate it better the second time around, I think if I remember correctly where my thoughts ultimately went with that is, they use that as a physical pause. Um, fuck, I don't remember the name of the term, but if you see a lot of like the writing that's happened in the last twenty years, um, kind of like this postmodern like like literature, mm-hmm. uh, like people like uh, Brett Easton Ellis, David Foster Wallace. Um, there's another guy who the guy who wrote um, extremely loud and incredibly close. I can't remember his name right now. Um, they use this kind of fractured storytelling techniques where they kind of get in deep and then they force you to go and look at something else that has nothing to do with what's going on. And it's so that you'll have an automatic reset. What, and it's not your choice. Like you have, you're forced to reset your focus on what's going on before you delve into the next section of story. Okay. Um, Oh, it's really pissing me off. If that is the mechanic, I still don't like it. Well, uh, well, whether you don't like it or not, um, I ju- I'm just trying to help you understand it because it yeah. seems like no, I, yeah, of- you're right. I really didn't. I really don't get it. Um, so I, I think if I remember, and I, I, I could be misstating this because I, I, I don't 100 percent remember now. Um, but I think the idea with that Jonathan Safran Foer is the name of the author. I knew it was another three named person. <laughs> um, I think that's they force you to pause because it has nothing to do with what else, the, the the branching storylines, right? Right. So I think that they're that what they're trying to do there is he's telling him it's kind of like the idea of like in when you play you remember like when you're playing like Super Mario and the the music pauses and then it starts over and it goes much faster. Mm-hmm. It's like hey, decision time is coming. Go. Right. Stop fucking around with these branching storylines. Your time is done. Make your choice. Okay. Because everything speeds up from there, right? That's that's about two thirds or so of the way through the movie, isn't it? It doesn't happen once. It happens a couple of times. No, no, I know. But once the final sequence of that, because they kind of just tease it a little bit the first couple times, right? I don't know. It felt like forever when those scenes happened. Yeah, because they don't give you much. At first, it's just kind of him like looking around and chasing him. But once he actually gets right. to the point where he talks to himself through the TV, okay, yeah, I guess it is. It is the same. Uh, it's like the same scene multiple times. It gets longer, maybe. Yes. Yeah. And then they finally, he finally has that final conversation with him. Right. And from there, everything starts to dovetail and tie back in together. Right. 
So uh, I, that, if I remember correctly, is what that device was doing there. Okay. I can see how that might be irritating. It, it just but... feels it just feels very unnecessary because I feel like I get I enjoy the rest of the movie so much and I get so much out of it and I think so much about it that those scenes pull me away from thinking about what I find to be the important parts of the movie. But I know, I... but I think whether you like it or not, that's intentional. That's the idea of the reset that I'm telling you about. Eh. You don't have to like it, but that's what it is. It's forcing you. It's it's almost like Okay, yeah, I want to get past this. Like, let me get back to the... But they, it's like it's used to tease you and get you back into... So you don't get lost in the proceedings that you're going clear-eyed yeah, but, into what's going on the rest of it. Yeah. Huh. I get it. I get what you're saying. I just don't think it's necessary. I, I agree with you, too. I think that that, that convention is overstated and I, overdone. Yeah, I find that it, it hinders the experience, if anything. But that's my... Um, my that's fair. Uh, uh, I, second, I'll take. I'll take that. Second level of freshman English. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that device yeah. is used for. Okay. Fair. I'm still not going to like it. Um, oh, you the, don't have <laughs> <laughs> uh, And then another thing that was strange was the the sequence where he gets shot. Yes. We opened the movie with all the sequences where he dies, right? Which very similar to the way they open Cloud Atlas. Right. It's like it's the drowning in the car, blowing up near Mars, and getting shot in the bathtub. Yes. All right. So now you're like 15 minutes into the movie, and you're like, dear God, Al, why do I have this on? <laughs> and that was also roughly the same time where I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the one with the... where he gets shot in the bathtub, I have a hard time remembering which branch that was a part of. Um, well, cause they had a few brand, they had several branches where he dies, right? There's the one where yeah. he's driving a scooter in like a fit of rage and he crashes and goes into a coma, right? Yeah. That leaf really took a spill on that leaf. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very slippery leaf. It was like a banana peel in, um, Mario Kart. Uh, huh. oh, damn. Um, <laughs> and that was in the one with the young Elise. Because doesn't he fall for her, yeah. and then she tells him to fuck off? Yeah, it's yeah, it, that's exactly what it is. No, it's, um, he gets he goes to her house. It's one of the ones with the young Elise. Yes, he goes to her house. He's gonna give her the envelope, but that guy is there, and he gets mad, and he drives away. Yes, without his um, the her. one. I think I want to say the one with the bathtub was. One where he was rejected by, or was forced to, to no longer be with Anna. Okay. I think that's where one of the ones where the parents didn't let them see each other anymore. That might be right. And he just gets super depressed and despondent, and the rest of his life he's just walking through the motions, and ultimately he ends up getting killed. Well, he's not walking through the motions. He's a total wild card. He's uh, he's two facing it up in that one. Was he? Yeah, he flips the coin to decide what he wants to do. He gets off, like, he flips the coin, he goes somewhere. He flips the coin when he gets off the airplane because there's a guy holding up a sign for to take someone somewhere in a limo, and he just pretends that he's that guy. Then he gets there, and he's wearing the guy's clothes, and then he goes and takes a bath, and when he gets out of the bath, there's a guy sitting there and kills him. And that guy is there to kill the guy that he's pretending to be. I do remember that him getting killed was a case of mistaken identity. Yeah. Um, which... It's funny because that reminded me of I just got to see a decent amount of Lucky Number Slevin recently, mm -hmm. which I really like that movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't think I've seen that one. That's one that you should watch and we should do. I, I feel like it's a movie that a lot of people forget exists. I actually really like that movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, getting back to it, I, I forgot that about the thing, but he does the, the coin toss thing, but it's just a proxy for choice again, right? Because he can't make the choices. That's why I was saying I thought to a certain extent he was going through the motions kind of. Well, it was he was taking it out of the like he doesn't need to make the choice. He's letting the coin do it. Yeah, that's all. But I don't remember him particularly enjoying himself, though, right? Not particularly. He did seem to have some fun impersonating this other guy, though. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that. See, that's one where I was kind of hazy on. So I remember the first time I watched it, I was definitely confused by that scene. Right. I definitely felt like I had a better feel for it after the second time I watched it. But I, I'm forgetting the specifics because ultimately it doesn't really matter because. It's another one where, and I thought that was actually a pretty cool mechanic, right? Where the one where he ends up in a coma, 
we actually see him roll it backwards, right? Yeah. Which I thought that was really cool because I think that was. He does that, that a, I think, a couple of times. But that might, I think that was the, That's first, the first one. Yeah. And that was a key moment for me watching it. And I imagine, like, most people watching it, where you get to understand this idea of the branching storylines and, oh, that's like these are choices that he's making in his mind right. that they're not happening in real time mm-hmm. because the whole thing is he's imagining this happening and it's like oh that's what'll happen to me ah, I don't really like how that story ended let me walk it back and make this other choice right yeah so I thought that was a, an important sequence because that's where you kind of get that initial understanding of the idea of unraveling the choice and redoing it in a different way yeah I, <laughs> I liked that I also like the idea the concept of like uh, what is it? The chess term where you can't. There's no other move to. The only viable move is to not move. Stalemate. Um, yeah, they had a. There was a word for it though that they used. I couldn't remember what it was. But um, I was just thinking, like in the director's cut, he's he's <laughs> on, he's on the train tracks and he does not choose to go with his mother or father. The train comes and ends the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it was piloted by a guy smoking a joint. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> What? <laughs> That's the best. That's the best one. <laughs> oh, we have to end it on that note. That was amazing. <laughs> Do you have anything else important? Because I don't think anything is more important than that. <laughs> um, Juno oh, Temple. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I could bring that full uh, circle for you. <laughs> That's what I'm here for, man. <laughs> Jesus, that was great. <laughs> Um, the only per- like thing that we didn't really talk about was um, Juno Temple. She was the only one who played a younger version of them who like is an actress or actor who matters. Yeah, no, she was great. I mean, I think we we touched on that storyline being the best one and the most captivating. Yeah, and, and I just thought it was cool that she, she, she I mean, because she wasn't anyone when that movie came out. Right. That's true. No, she she did great though in this. Like, they, they were they were they were very those young actors were very convincing. Yes. And, the, and again, the that movie. kind of played into the idea of why I liked the story of him ending up with Anna, right? Because mm-hmm. um, the two of them also had great chemistry. Right. Young Anna and young um, Nemo. Mm-hmm. The uh, uh, that scene where they they it's such a it's a great shot where they meet in the train station. It looks like. It almost looks like Penn or something like that, but they're she's coming down the escalator and he's. Oh, standing. it is. It's uh, well, I don't remember if it was either Penn Station or it was Grand Central. Grand Central. They're in New York City. Was, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you know, maybe it was Grand Central. Maybe that's home. It was Grand. It Central. was one of those two for yeah, sure. It was Grand Central. Um, it had to be based on the way that that looks. But anyway, the 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 way the, the way they do that shot where like the two of them see each other and there's nothing else and everything like there's just like kind of like blurry lines and movement in the background. Yeah. And they slow it down. So good. Great scene. Yes. Loved it. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I liked how they even did that one a couple of different ways, right? Yeah. One time he sees her, one time he doesn't, uh-huh. and all that sort of stuff. See, it's, it's stuff like that. That's what really set this movie kind of apart for me as an experience. It's just – there was just this attention to detail and this care that was clearly exhibited throughout this movie, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that even though it's not necessarily a big budget movie that, you know, it was made by someone you've never heard of before and may never hear of again. And it's made with a bunch of actors and actresses who are like, oh, were they that person who was in that thing? Mm-hmm. Um, to see that level of care and stuff like that. I don't know. I just thought it was cool. A lot of those different types of scenes, you know what I yeah, mean? For sure. Yeah, there's... Uh, there's... There's a lot to the movie. There's a lot to like about it. Like I said, I feel like there's a lot to criticize about it, obviously, but there's that's fine. That's kind of that's the point. That's why we're here. Just let you know that there there is a director's cut of this movie. No, no, I said that earlier. I I would I would like to see it, and um, if if that scene doesn't happen with the train and the joint, then (laughs) missed opportunity. Forty-seven million dollar budget. Yeah, I know. I was, oh, I that is a that's a hell of an opening weekend in the U.S. One thousand six hundred and twelve dollars. That had to have been in like 
two theaters. Gross, three thousand six hundred. Yep, I was right. Four theaters. <laughs> it says four screens. Wow, that's crazy. But anyway, um, if you're into in, yeah. if you're into pulling movies apart, if you're into interesting concepts of time and choice, um, it's worth it's definitely worth watching. I will say you do need to stick it out to appreciate any of it. If you bail oh, okay. out of the movie, I wouldn't blame you, but um, you're not going to get the whole. You're obviously not going to get the experience that we had with it. Well, I what I would hope the case would be is if if you've listened to this and you're hearing us say this now. Um, that you should go see it, but if you you've heard us talk about this and you you've heard both of our experiences pretty similar, where it was like oh the first fifteen twenty minutes were tough and then it becomes a worthwhile endeavor after that. I, I would hope that you would be willing to give it its due and stick through it at that point. You know, right? Cool. You got anything else? No, I'm glad we did this. I'm glad Me you too. finally saw it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I watched it. That was a it was a nice one to throw on at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this week's Flicks in the Six, a Spin Tune production. Check out SpinTune.com to catch a new episode every Monday or Tuesday and a new article every Thursday. <laughs> if you want to keep the conversation going, you can reach us at The Spin Tune on Twitter and Facebook or email The Spin Tune at gmail.com. That's T H E S P I N C H O O N. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>